every morning we wake up in a slightly different world than yesterday. And in order to keep up with the changes, as the world is, world is changing, you have to change. In order to inspire people, to motivate people and to direct people uh, uh, and not to be afraid of changes, we bring interesting and uh, uh, compelling people to talk about uh, the change. Today, uh, we have my good friend uh, Abhishek Shah, uh, co-founder and uh, uh, CEO of uh, RSA Global. Abhishek, thank you very much for coming in the change Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, usually, we have here uh, a bit more older people than you are, but your story is long enough uh, to inspire people, and this is why we brought you here today to, to just talk about the changes you took in your life and uh, personal or business life and uh, try to inspire people watching this uh, vlog. So from which part of your story shall we start? From your private or business? But I think private is a good one. Yeah? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, more than happy. You were yeah. born in? I was actually born in, uh, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, in East Africa. Uh, we grew up there. Um, my family moved there in the early 80s. Uh, my father moved for work. Uh, and it was actually a very interesting place to grow up. You know, you weren't exposed to all the great things of the world. Uh, it was a very low-key area, uh, but it was still financial capital for Eastern Central Africa. Uh, uh, and, you know, the food, the weather, and the way we were educated was very different. Uh, it was in 2001 that my family decided to move to uh, Dubai, the UAE. 2001? 2001. So just before all the craziness. <laughs> just before all the craziness. Yeah. Uh, what was Dubai like in 2001? So 2001, I think, was just at the start of uh, their globalization initiative. You know, they had just, in 1999, opened Burj Al Arab. Uh, so tourism was on the agenda. Uh, 2001 was the first time that they allowed foreigners uh, to buy property. And that just really sparked that very large phase uh, from that perspective. Uh, so I went to high school here. Um, I was fortunate enough to... Uh, Which part of the city you lived in? So we actually lived in there, near the airport. Uh -huh. uh, that's where we lived for eight years uh, when we moved to the country for the first time, or the city for the first time. Uh, and then from there on, I uh, went to high school uh, in Dubai, um, you know, made a lot of great friends. Uh, but it was in that time also my business journey started at the same time as well. Um, so we come from a family of... This is what I'm saying, you're yeah. very young. Yes, yes. Yeah, you started business very young. So I, I did not have, I did not start my own business at that point, but we come from a family of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. uh, of business people, are always looking for opportunity. And my father is, is, is a, 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 I would say, one of my greatest mentors and teachers. And uh, uh, every summer in high school, uh, I was either his driver or his assistant. Uh, and um, and he saw the, he had the eye to seeing opportunities. And, um, um, at that, at that time, it was uh, there was an excess uh, demand over supply in Dubai for everything, right? Of course. Whether it be housing, cars, uh, real estate, whatever it might be. Uh, so he found a gap in industrial real estate. <clears throat> and so he built a couple of small warehouses in Tibilali Free Zone, uh, the South Zone, um, and uh, really built uh, uh, something that was sought after by some customers. So we had a couple of customers from Europe. and. Uh, um, uh, we were not able to be a logistics company at that point, uh, even though I asked, challenged, why don't we do the services rather than just real estate? Because there were certain laws that didn't allow uh, uh, foreigners to do those things. But would you say, would you say that uh, you said that you're thankful that you had an opportunity to learn from yeah. your father? But uh, is it good to be uh, a son of an entrepreneur? So it, it depends which way you take it. <laughs> it depends <laughs> which way you take it, right? Yeah. Uh, I think you have to be. Uh, I'm asking for my kids, this is why. No, of course, of course. <laughs> I think it's, it's a great experience that we have. So I think there was tough lessons in that. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, I'd be excited to go for a meeting, but it'd say, no, you can't come to this meeting, stay in the car. So I'd stay in the car for two hours in the sun in the AC, <laughs> uh, not really enjoying it. But otherwise, I'd go in there and just be a fly on the wall and try to learn and listen. Um, and, and later on in life, now is when I really appreciate it because I, I learned massive things from that perspective and where mistakes are allowed to be given. Uh, mm -hmm. to me, because they, they, it's un unrelenting from that perspective, right, uh, from that point. So, I mean, to, to move forward from that, you know, we, we, we then, um, uh, Sheikh Mohammed launched a new project called Dubai World Central at that time, now Dubai South, where the new airport is, new airport, yeah. where he said all these services could be done by uh, foreigners as well, mm -hmm. foreign investors. What was the year then? Uh, that was 2005, and 2005 is when I went to uh, university in the UK. Uh, uh -huh. So I did uh, civil engineering uh, at the University of Warwick. How, how was that change from Dubai to UK? So I think from a very young age, we've always been in the British education system. 
So it was a very natural uh, progression that we were going to go to the UK for further education for us. Yeah, so the way that we want to, we win that education, we win that uh, system. Uh, our teachers always prepped us for that. So it was something we looked forward to. Uh, uh, and I enjoyed that change. I enjoyed that change because it's the first time you truly find yourself. I think I grew the most in those Were you afraid a little bit of that change? <sighs> afraid of um, uh, not knowing how to be by myself alone. Right? Until that point, I was always around people, I was at friends, I was at family. And there you go in, I, had not, I didn't know anybody in that university, I'd never seen the university. I looked it up online, I applied, I got in. Uh, I was lucky to get in, I wasn't yeah. the best at school. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was lucky to get in. And uh, uh, then from there, you know, you just find yourself. You find what makes you comfortable, you find your group of people. Uh, and I think university was probably the biggest change in my life of my character. Uh, and learning what is important. Yeah, uh, you, uh, then you define your relations towards other people, mm -hmm. towards uh, other social groups, and this yeah, is something that, uh, that uh, really sparked uh, something, probably. So, it, what was, again, I think the biggest takeaway was it, it, your tolerance to what the world has grew tremendously. Because, you know, Dubai, even though it's such a large melting pot of cultures, you don't really see the full spectrum of it. Um, and uh, over there, it was everybody from everywhere. Uh, of course, with a large British influence uh, of, of, of the English English culture, uh, but you know Warwick in particular as a university is a very large international population as well. So it was amazing from hobbies to cultural activities to educational activities to just how social social environment was. And then, and then uh, after university, you came back to Dubai. Yeah. So uh, this is a very interesting part of the story. So. 2005, when we learned about that project, our, our customers in the earlier ones actually bought us out. And uh, we, we launched in 2007 uh, in um, uh, Dubai South at that point um, by taking all these licenses. And everything was built around the fact that Dubai was still going through its boom and the airport was going to start in 2008 over there. Oh, yeah. So we said we'd open up in 2009. And of course, that wasn't the reality. We opened up. A very large investment, uh, so you can imagine a 30,000 square meter building warehouse is what we built as, as our first opening investment, um, uh, all which was pre-subscribed with customers. But the moment you opened the doors, there was no one. Everyone had gone with the economy. Of uh, uh, and I think at that time, you know, everybody was in a tough space. We didn't have the right uh, operating environment, so there was no roads, no electricity, no customs, nothing you could do for the logistics work. Um, and uh, so we took, we took a call and I said, I want to learn more about the business. So I went to Singapore, right? oh, yeah. uh, which is the, let's say, the center of the world for logistics when it came to uh, uh, meeting every third person who was probably in that field. So I did an unpaid internship for about six to eight months in, in Singapore because there was nothing happening in Dubai as soon as yeah. I graduated to learn. So rather than sitting around trying to figure something out. So you support working for free uh, when you're learning? When you're learning, of, of yeah. course, of yeah, course, of course. Right. I think those are the ones where you understand the true value of education because uh, nobody's telling you to do it, you want to do it, and yeah. nobody's paying you for it either, yeah. right? So uh, you, you understand what your motives in life are. But what were the learnings of that uh, Singapore trip? Uh, so I think Singapore that Singapore trip, was, adventure, again, yeah. it was one of the worst times in the world to be in the shipping industry. Yes. Think, uh, you know, they, 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 Everything all, stopped, yeah. There was all those stories where you could walk from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur uh, on shipping containers, uh, shipping vessels, because they were just out of work. Right? Yeah, yeah. They were all parked one side or the other. Um, and uh, uh, so I think my learnings were um, that the industry was still very uh, manual, still very immature. Uh, it was a global industry, um, so impact of one part of the world had massive ramifications right throughout the global supply chain. And that's actually what triggered my interest at a very young age when I would take, go to a store and see that it was made in Vietnam, and I would learn that it was actually tagged in Vietnam with the price in Dubai. Uh, how does the supply chain work? How does that information flow work? How does it work together? That's what really was the question. That built in my mind all the way through. But do you, do you think today uh, the logistics industry is uh, on the cutting edge of technology or is a little bit lagging? So that, that's a very difficult question to answer because logistics is tremendously interconnected, right? It, yeah. it, it is, it is uh, private uh, forwarding. That's its job to be interviewed. Exactly. Private forwarding companies, government regulations, yeah. uh, uh, customs authorities around the world, uh, uh, product producers and manufacturing. Uh, and and, and to, to answer your question, I would say the most accurately, I think there is elements of it which are just over the last three to four years having huge technology investments and advancement. But the traditional industry, like the old big shipping lines, which you cannot avoid, um, until very recently still worked very manually, still didn't allow access to information so that you could update your customers in real time and things like that. So um, today, 
if you look at what's happening in the world of logistics, immense amount of investment is going to solve the challenge of building train, right? Uh, and, it, and it's come last. If you look at all the amount of technology innovation that's happened in the last 20 years, it seems to have come much later down the road. Uh, because maybe it's a working industry, it's very working industry, active. And, and it's too large a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Building train is, you know, yeah, trillions of dollars, yeah, 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 trillions yeah, yeah. of dollars. So uh, but I think the time is now. We're actually living in probably one of the most exciting times when it comes to that uh, going forward. Yeah, there are some new solutions, uh, especially when it comes to the logistics and uh, supply chain uh, uh, in uh, in uh, blockchain uh, technologies used used yeah. to to exactly know each uh, uh, part of uh, something when when it was uh, how it was built, uh, the origins of all materials and, and uh, absolutely. Right. So you know, our vision at RSA of what we're trying to do now is is, is we come from the back from the, the school of thought that. There's no single technology, no single country, or no single government that could actually completely change the supply chain industry in the world. It is a convergence of different types of technologies coming together that will challenge business models, challenge uh, operating solutions, uh, and that will have the most impact going forward. And that means the inclusion of, of blockchain uh, uh, in, in smart contracts to uh, AI learning and reading through data to predict what the customer is going to have stock out. Uh, and then presenting that in the most simplest format for your customers to take decisions about their business. I think that's where the world is converging to now. You know what? I, I, I really I think I said this in three or four episodes, but uh, uh, but each and every guest here is talking about when when, when we asked him about the future yeah. of in the industry that he's in. And we had people from uh, 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 ecology, we had people from uh, finance, we had people from. Uh, uh, finance services, uh, Google, you know, so everybody's talking about big data yeah. and artificial intelligence in order to sort out this data and use it. So you, you also think that uh, uh, AI and machine learning will help sort out the big data. Uh, we now have big data. We have we a do. lot we of do. data, right. but what to do so, with so it? I think the biggest challenge... Since we touched that, that topic. No, of course. We'll, we'll go back to it. It's, it's a topic of great uh, interest and passion for me personally. It, you know, the logistics industry or the supply chain industry, by virtue, has a lot of data touch points. You know, we know a lot about what is being shipped for our customers. Yeah. We, we gather a lot of data. The challenge always is, is that I think technology today is generally the easy part. Right? It's generally easier to create the technology. It's marrying it with the offline world that yeah. makes it very difficult. Right? How do you actually make sense of it to understand all the different variables that you need to? That's why you think B2B e-commerce today is just picking up now after B2C has become fairly mature in most parts of the world. Yes. Because that was quite easy. I was delivering to an individual and I had most of the other elements under my control. Here, a business is still an unmoving part. You can't really predict what a business needs, right? So you've got to build a lot more variables and that's where the data set comes in to help you understand how the business operates. Uh, uh, so I think that, that's how, how we see the world. It's marrying the online and offline uh, where the real magic needs to happen. Yeah, so uh, throughout the history uh, of uh trade and logistics and, 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 and uh, this, this uh, industry, uh, there, there were many changes. But I wanted to ask you, since uh, by chance or not, you know, our companies also have uh, representative offices in Singapore and in Dubai, and uh, uh, do you find, uh, how, how do you find the different or the same Dubai and Singapore when it comes to the logistics, when it comes to your business? Yeah, so I think, look, uh, uh, they are both have a lot of similarities. Uh, similarities in the sense that they are both trade hubs, right? Neither of them have tremendous domestic demand, right? Yeah. Uh, they are, because by virtue of the size of the country and the size of the population, they can't have huge demand. But they're both very large economies uh, in their own right. Uh, so they serve on the hub and spoke model, that here we're making ease of business uh, very high, uh, uh, and you know we welcome high infrastructure. Uh, so we make it easy for you to hold product here, and then decide where you'd like to have it going forward. So I think there's a huge amount of similarity from that perspective. Uh, it's just that Singapore is obviously a lot more mature. They're, they're, they're much older as a, yeah. uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a country, as a, as, a, as a government, and the UAE has done this in a much shorter period of time. Yeah. Uh, what, what Dubai has done in in the, in the past years, it's almost unbelievable, you know, uh, coming through uh, from uh, trading ships uh, in Greek yeah. to Pakistan yeah. and uh, right. India yeah. uh, to uh, maybe one of the things that uh, Dubai has and, and probably RSA Global sense that is that uh, the biggest container uh, uh, port in the world is Jabal Ali yeah. 
Yeah, connected. It's, it's a top ten. Yes. Yeah, top ten in the world. And yeah. and then uh, uh, connected to the airport in the same free zone. Correct. So you don't spend. So you sense that as as an opportunity, no matter the 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 the, the shipping trail to Dubai is not so simple. You know, you have no, to go no, into the no. Gulf, but still it gives you an opportunity to to uh, have an advantage uh, in in front of other ports around. You know. So, so look, if you want if you want to talk about the advantages of Dubai as a trade hub and logistics hub, there's plenty. There's plenty, um, and, and you hit on one very very important piece. So uh, even though they're not the easiest shipping route. They created the infrastructure well ahead of the game. So they created the port infrastructure, the ability to handle capacity, uh, and make it very easy to hold product here uh, in, in the free zone concept as well, right? Um, uh, secondly, yeah, the vision of the country was to have a top 10 global TU port with uh, what is, is, is scheduled to be the world's largest airport all within 10 kilometers of each other. No, that's uh, allowing multi-border trade, multi trade. trade, and we have made subsequently very large investments to try and leverage this going forward in the future as well. Uh, and we can talk about those uh, yeah. uh, going forward. Um, but but what's what's most important through through that whole process is that today when you look at connectivity uh, uh, of shipping lines and airlines, everything nearly from the, uh, the, the eight hours flying time or two thirds of world population is within a single flight. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yes. so when you have that kind of accessibility from this center point, uh, depending on which world map you look at, uh, you're in a very good position to serve most of the world's population. You know what? Uh, through eyes of the uh, someone not from logistics, you know, when you when you see, it, we living in Dubai uh, think that we have an advantage living here yeah. because we choose where to go for a summer vacation, winter vacation, everything around you. There are so many ski resorts, there are summer good. resorts, and but in front, uh, when you look it through the goggles of uh, logistics industry, it's it's uh, it's literally the population and the population around you. Uh, are from from Asia and Africa are the ones that are the ones growing the fastest with the highest middle middle income families with expandable income for the next twenty years. Uh, we came to the uh, on the topic of uh, RSA Global. Yeah. Uh, when you had this big investment in yes. uh, uh, free zone in uh, airport free zone yes. in uh, uh, Dubai World Trade uh, etc. Uh, what happened after you yeah. went to you had you had you happened. Uh, you went to Singapore for yeah. this internship and then you came back? Yeah, so there's a, there's a funny personal and uh, professional story there. Yeah. So it was my decision to say that, okay, nothing's happening here because you know 2009 was a very challenging year on a global scale. Yeah, of course. Um, um, so I took the decision to go personally to Singapore and to learn over there. And remember when I told you earlier I was very uh, uh, challenged on being alone by myself? I moved to the whole country not knowing a single person, right? Okay. No work colleagues, no friends. So that's where I truly learned how to uh, Establish connections. Be, be, yeah. with, be with myself, be alone. Like yeah. it was something as simple as watching a movie on my own. I felt very uncomfortable before yeah. that, but I was okay after that. So personal growth was tremendous. Um, and, and then we came, I came back early 2010, um, um, uh, uh, and, and a lot of credit here has to go to my father for holding down the ship during such a, yeah. such a tough time. Uh, and 2010, we strategized. We strategized, okay, what are we going to do? Um, and then we, we, we took on three main strategies at that point. One was to invest heavily in technology, so to find out what, what is there in the gap uh, that we can invest in. Two is um, make sure that we are a bottom line focused company, so we don't want to go straight forwarding. Okay. Logistics can be a very high revenue game, but very little money from that point. We were a private organization that wanted good returns on our investment. And third was we were going to go after niche markets. Right? Uh, niche markets means things that were, we just felt from infrastructure, service, and technology service point of view underserved. Uh, so that was everything from uh, petrochemicals to uh, finished vehicles to... How, how does that happen? You just sit uh, having a breakfast with your father and say, you know what, in the next few... Or how, how it happens? No, so you know, so it, it's, it's, it's a tough decision. In hindsight, you would say a lot of it was strategy, but a lot of it is luck. A lot of it is being right place, right time, and be putting a lot of effort in to have the right conversations. So you, know, you don't just sit around waiting for it to come to you. You are constantly, because you have to survive and you have to die. You're talking to many people, and by, by luck, you'll meet the right person, right? Because you are making the effort to do that. And I've seen that happen multiple it's times. It's luck to life. meet someone, but to connect more with him. You've got to make the effort. He, you have, yeah, yeah. So, so it's combination, I would say. Uh, of course, of course. But, but you know, uh, that was a kind of a scary decision. Okay, we have three directions for our big company right yeah. now, and uh, we'll go that way or that way or that way. It's, it's a scary decision. I, I, what I want to point out is uh, people are usually afraid of change. Yeah. But 
the change is uh, uh, the only constant, as we say here. You know, so, like, so I think the biggest the difference with that statement now, and I'll, I'll tell you what I feel now yeah. 10 years later, is that time I had uh, uh, nothing, I had no business built to lose, right? So yeah. it, 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 we were at zero. I mean, yeah. We were just starting out, we were a startup. So it was either we did that to survive, or it was nothing, right? So uh, uh, when we, it wasn't a change for us. It was, it was like, either this or you are yeah. going to be left with nothing. Uh, uh, so it, it, it was that's that. a good master. That's a good master. Like <laughs> you starve to death if you don't do that. You know. Like. I mean, and that's literally what it was. So you would go out and you would understand. And I had little to no experience of how you do commerce with uh, uh, big big companies. But it was understanding that uh, uh, from need of the market, just listening. I think that's where that whole concept of having two of these and one of this is very yeah. important. You listen and learn, and you start seeing the patterns of what's missing, right? Um, and uh, uh, you know. 2010 continued that way. We made those investments further into technology and, and building the right team. We were still about eight, seven or eight people, the company. Mm -hmm. 2010, um, um, the, the airport actually opened then, uh, and we saw a small amount of uh, um, trade start flowing through yeah. there, primarily to do with the US military. Uh, Obama had sent to tell move all the troops out of the Afghanistan and Iraq, and that airport was used as the staging site. So yeah. we got a little bit of that work as being a subcontractor to other yeah. markets. Uh, and the market was sort of starting to recover a little bit. So that year is when we did a lot of our, uh, our tenders, so our business works with tenders. And uh, uh, in the middle of 2011 is when we, st we started seeing some business success. And this is when one of the biggest changes came. We came from having about, I would say, seven or I think it was nine people, early 11 till um, um, the beginning of 12, we went to about 160 people. Wow. Right? So and a lot of these are operating people, are operating people in the warehouse yeah, to, yeah. to do forklift driving and picking, but it was recruiting, it was well, understanding qualities, yeah. and we had none of that. Because the biggest challenge in our business was nobody knew the knowledge. We were all new to the business. We had business acumen, but there was no professional that to say that, hey, now this is the kind of benchmark salary for this kind of role, this is how process should be designed, this is how you should recruit people, this is how you do customer service SLAs. So everything was mistake, 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 learn on the job, Customers believe in you, but I think that's the biggest part. My customers yeah. believe in us. Yeah, that, that, that's that's uh, pretty uh, uh, inspirational uh, few thoughts that uh, you just said. You know, uh, Richard Branson says, you know, like uh, if you want to uh, take some job, take it, then go back seven days, and in seven days you will learn how to yeah. do that job. You know, you learn by doing and by make, making mistakes. Yeah. You know, but 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 people usually do not even start something because they are afraid that they will make a mistake. Mm -hmm. But I think that what you are supporting is make a mistake, learn from it, be uh, transparent and be open to the clients and, and uh, earn their trust. Uh, absolutely, I think because our, our, our first customers were very big names, very large multinational companies that we were telling them, take a bet on us, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you have to believe that we will uh, uh, do, do you a good service. Or when you mess up, we'll fix it. But we'll give us that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think that's how it ha happened. And uh, partnership was a very big way of how we operated. Because uh, to get yeah, access, we have a lot of partnerships. That's one of the we have a lot big of topics. Of uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. because um, collaboration. Uh, I learned at a very young age and through education that it's too large a world to be able to take on your own, um, that, and with limited resources, you couldn't do much. So we always look for partners. And you know, your name states global. Yes. RSA global. Yeah. So if you want to uh, scale it globally, you have to have. A, how do you find a good partner in in twenty first century? Yeah. So I, I think I think there's a few things. So we've had a, ver a variety of different partners, whether they be uh, service partners or actual uh, 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 equity partnerships yeah. uh, to build new products uh, and services. Um, so I think the first thing is that we look for a partner that is actually going to be uh, an entrepreneur led company. Uh, um, so, so we are able to speak to the founders uh, uh, one on one. The same language. Uh, the same language, but also understand each other's challenges and ambitions, right? Yeah. Uh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. today, if, if somebody is 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 a, uh, a venture backed or a, a public company, sometimes the decisions aren't in the senior management's hands, yeah. and you are building your organization at that age around that company. So yeah. you need to know what is their future direction, what what are their ambitions uh, going forward. Uh, now it might be different because we're at a different scale, but at that point is yeah. what we were looking at from that point of view. So if there is an issue, I can literally call up the owner, we can have a discussion, shareholder to shareholder, uh, and understand what the challenges are, how yeah. to solve them going forward. So that was one, one aspect. Second is, 
um, uh, uh, they have to understand the value of humility between both of us, right? Um, that, that, you know, you, you may be way more experienced, but there's certain things we know better than you, and certain things you know better than us. Let's bring those things together to add, bring something that's tremendously valuable to the market. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, and the last piece is, is that uh, generally you want to have some sort of equal standing, right? Uh, we, we never want it to be uh, uh, so large that we totally dominate and, and too small that we totally dominate. There had to be a good sustainability of the partnership going forward. I think that's how we look at that. Uh, yes, uh, having a, a good partner in, in the field that, that you are not maybe excel at and then uh, bring it on board just to uh, have a full product or whatever. Uh, uh, is there any partnership that you didn't like or didn't turn out well? In, uh... you know, so I, I think the ones that didn't work uh, through, our, through our period was, was, it was exactly because one of those three things didn't fit. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's how it came to those three elements there. It's because sometimes the uh, what was said on paper uh, versus the actual direction of what well, wasn't actually the reality. Yeah. So both of you are pulling in different directions. There's no way there's going to be value to the customer, right? Because all those are being done to add value to a particular customer. I mean, customer centricity is, is, is how we've tried to operate. Um, and, and I think some of those are, it's, it's, it, and, and how you deal with those is very easy. You just sit down and say, I think this isn't working. And it, it's kind of when you have an employee that also you has, the company has outgrown them. Uh, they can't grow anymore. Sure. Just having this sit down conversation with them and saying that uh, uh, I don't think this is working actually is relief for both parties, right? Yeah. Because sometimes you're just dragging on the pain for as long because it's we just We just it. had the conversation like that, but you, you have to, you have to uh, keep things uh, going and you can still uh, be friends or whatever, you know. Like, sure. but I think that's easier if, to if do. You're not, uh, if you're not sure. Because you don't know, I mean, I think, again, managing relationships uh, is almost a big part of my job. I think I see my yeah. job as strategy coaching and managing relationships, right? Uh, uh, but, but maybe uh, but, uh, we can sum it up in, in one word, and that's leadership. Mm. Uh, at a very, very young age, like you, you had seven, eight employees, and then in yeah. 2011, it grew to 160 employees. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, what, what are the responsibilities? First, what are the responsibilities? Because everybody's thinking about, oh, leader is, you know, like a CEO just going to some fancy dinners or, What are, but what are the responsibilities of a leader? So uh, I, have, I have actually a very strong personal journey on this one. Um, so from 2012 to 2015, when the market sort of picked up again, we did extremely well. Uh, and and uh, uh, we grew uh, uh, horizontally in our business units. We grew geographically as well. We expanded into Kenya. Um, and, and by 2015, I think we were about uh, maybe 190 people. Um, and uh, um, We were doing okay, right? Uh, and, and people came to me and said, um, so what's next? And I had no answer. I, had, I, I really hadn't thought about it because everything was based on opportunity and the market driving the decisions, not a strategy from us. Uh, and I think at that point in time is where, is where I turned to the peer-to-peer -peer sharing entrepreneurship world to find out how other entrepreneurs dealt with that kind of situation. Oh. So I joined uh, entrepreneurship organizations to learn from other entrepreneurs and I hit this plateau and then figured out what okay, to do. Uh, but but how did you approach that problem, right? Yeah. Um, And what, what is, can you can you share what what was the solution to that problem? Because we want to inspire people also to bring uh, entrepreneurs, you know, and inspire them to. I think the, the biggest question you can ask yourself that I was asked by somebody, and I had to go back, go away and think about it before I could answer it, is that what is your definition of success? Uh, and I think once you go dig deep and you find that out, that's when you start understanding an end, end goal. And I think that was the first time ever we started thinking about what's this business going to look like in 10 years. Um, and, I, you know, I got people around me. I, I really invested in finding mentors, right? Uh, I think that's super important uh, to, to, to get inspiration. To mentors? Or board members? What, what, is there a difference? No, but board members came much later for us. Uh, uh -huh. uh, but first it was having the access to just intellectual capital. Wh which kind of mentors? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So, 2016. It, I'm asking because of this. <laughs> I want to learn. You know, no, 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 okay. for sure. 2016, <laughs> we had uh, um, four or five different companies within the group, and, and, and all of them sort of had RSA in their name, but they all looked very different. So, there was yeah. no cohesive brand identity there. Um, uh, and and I, I got a chance to meet one of the leaders of one of the uh, leading media groups in the region um, uh, th through, through a network. And, you know, I walked in and I showed him, look, this is what my company looks like and wanted some advice on branding. And, and, and basically, the first thing he said to me is, he goes, what the 
because that yeah. right uh, it goes they all look like different companies you didn't look like you affiliated at all and it was and that was all I needed for somebody to say that to yeah, go yeah. back and inspire yeah, a massive course, change yeah, 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 sometimes it's just somebody from the outside giving you this view I think that it's you never always, think about I think it's yeah. always yeah. because like uh, with, a, with a psychotherapist uh, you know like he's not giving you the answers yes he's just asking you questions and you have to uh, resolve it and this is also with the business therapist Absolutely. or my mentors Absolutely. they just spark something yeah. and they say and they, oh they, yeah that's it that's it they, they look at it from a different angle they poke holes in, it in a different way uh, yeah, uh, from that point way. of view so you know I think getting involved with a whole bunch of other people that have been through a journey like me before was tremendously helpful like like uh, branding specialists uh, like uh, that, that was from the mentorship side yeah. but also people that have grown their business uh-huh, entrepreneurs yeah right so we at that time were maybe uh, exercise but I wanted to be 10 times bigger than that so yeah. that was my personal goal right uh, to add value to my customers going that way um, so so uh, for us to do that then okay you, you realize that every time you took a company and grew it by twice every process was wrong you have to break it down and start again uh, and that's a big thing and sometimes you understand people that are loyal to that have been through the difficult times the company is too big for them now they can't graduate to the next level yeah. how do you have that conversation how yeah. do you find the right talent how do you attract the right yeah. talent Um, and which brings us where to what today you know we did we then chose to go into the Indian market we acquired a company there last year we did uh, a second joint venture with an American airline uh, all with the ambition of becoming a problem solver for the supply chain and connecting it all for our customers um, uh, but when you look today 10 years on we sit in an industry that's highly fragmented still but consolidation on a large global level is happening and and that means that people are now afraid of technology and know that they have to own the customer end to end Uh, and for us that means going through our own digital journey and now this is where I'll loop back to your initial question of now fear and change and fear of change is coming in right uh, yeah, fear of change is always present yes but today's, but never, never but today's today. fear yeah. Yeah, yeah today's fear is uh, in, in uh, digitalization is it digitalization or change the, the fear is not about the digitalization I think my executive team uh, um, and myself believe in that very very clearly yeah it's how to do the execution when you have 500 minds to basically align, right? Uh, uh, so that they don't feel fearful. They don't, everyone believes technology is going to take their job, which is not the reality in most cases. Uh, finding customers to believe, to experiment with you on that. And again, like I said, marrying that great technology with the offline world, right? Making all that work because it's very easy to make the wrong bet. Right? Yeah. And I'm living this right now. I don't have the answer. I can tell you in a year whether I was successful or not. Uh, because you may make the wrong bet in the, the wrong sort of technology or the wrong people or the wrong partners and, from that and, point of view. And, and, the, and the, uh, the changes are happening so quick, so Absolutely. fast. Absolutely. Uh, the, one of the things that uh, working with Microsoft taught us is uh, they, uh, Satya Nadella, CEO of uh, Microsoft, even issued a book, uh, Hit Refresh. Yeah. about digital transformation yes. on in Microsoft. Absolutely. And he, what he's stating there, we didn't finish. Yes. We didn't say, this is the right. The, I'm ju- we are just explaining how 125,000 uh, people company is doing ju- digital transformation. And the, uh, the, the, the things are happening so fast as, as one of the uh, leaders, uh, heads of uh, Coca-Cola worldwide uh, said, we are living in the world of better versions. Yeah. You don't have time. You have to develop uh, you know, like, uh, everything. And I, honestly, I, to go back to your early question of how I view leadership and what we tell the people is that you know, the job is strategy, coaching, uh, and, and delivering the vision of the, of the business. Satya Nadella's example is actually the power of leadership summed up, right? Yeah. The way he's turned around that company, just becoming a, as a different mindset. Uh, and funny enough, our team is reading that book right now. Uh, that's why, uh, that's really? why she, she was laughing. Um, <laughs> really? uh, and it's an amazing story, right? And that's what gives you the power to understand that great leadership can change the world, right? Uh, and this is what we're aspiring to do now. One of the key words in that book is empathy. Mm. And uh, this is uh, coming more and more because in 90s or 2000s, you could see a big conglomerate uh, companies like working in the, you were not, you were the, just a number. And, and here is empathy to understand yeah. and then evolve or uh, create a product that is exactly for you and then uh, uh, help you achieve something more. That's the, you, that's the you, goal. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think today it's, it's coming back to everything we talked about. It's that hyper-personalization because we collect so much data about you as a customer or you as a consumer. We are able to then understand what exactly your needs are and hopefully predict it for you. 
it's almost scary if you watch the great the big <laughs> hack or whatever but it's where the world is going with that amount of data because we want to be able to tell you what's going to happen next for you and help you get there overall as a customer yes uh, uh, that's uh, uh, being a leader is not just being a leader in logistics or in the IT company being a leader is uh, much more than that. how do you uh, uh, practice or how do you learn how do you do you still have mentors uh, to do that or absolutely where, where do you find your inspiration what are the sources of your inspiration so uh, source of inspiration 100% come from uh, working with my team every day right i think your job as a leader is to get people that are better than around you i think that's a saying that's, that most most people now yes. accept and try to yeah. do Uh, second is you always look for it outside your business, other industries. Uh, um, you know, so for example, just this year we formalized a, a board which consists of VCs, uh, uh, e-commerce specialists to operations specialists to help us run our business even better. Uh, we bring in external speakers to our business uh, uh, every couple of weeks to do an interview like this, but with the team for the benefit of selfish of our team. So we get inspiration from them. Um, and, and, and lastly is reading, uh, keeping yourself up to date and, and being a very, very inquisitive, hungry person. So one of the key messages to my company and to my team is that the people that are hungriest will get the biggest opportunities going forward. Uh, within the company and within the world going forward for sure that's the that's the that's the thing of uh, th- there are so many books uh, vlogs podcasts uh, uh, courses uh, uh, so so, much, so many of them free or very uh, let's say cheap you you can find so many stories that in, that can ins- inspire you correct yeah. uh, one of the things that uh, we like to do in this blog also is ins- inspire people yeah. uh, not to be afraid of the change. So what I, what I wanted to ask you is uh, we are talking about the change all the time. And we, you said, oh yeah, a few years ago we did that. A few years ago we did that. Now we are doing this. It's a little bit frightening, you know. But one of, one of the things people do not even start with, a, with a, some business or some ideas or even to date someone, you know, is because of the fear. What is your call on, on that? I, I remember saying from uh, my grandfather, he used to say this to my young, um, he goes, what's the worst that could happen is you get told no, right? A very common saying, but I think when you build up your life around that, is that don't be afraid to ask your customer for an increase in price. The, what's the worst he's going to say? It's no. Okay, he's not going to feel bad, but you just you've, you've, you've figured it out and you've got a closed loop on it now. So I think that's that's my personal approach to it. Um, uh, but when the stakes are higher, there's a lot of variables, right? Of um, you, don't, you don't know what could happen. You, you, you keep thinking about the future. Um, and there's a very famous quote that actually sits above my office uh, uh, um, is, you know, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And when you approach it with that mindset, uh, um, you really start putting the destiny in your own hands. Of course, there's so many other variables, but all you can control is what you know and what you're working on. Uh, and, and, and you know, it comes back down to the fear being of those small tactical decisions against that bigger fear. So have I hired the right person? Do I have the right people working on it? Is it the right technology partner? Is it the right uh, country to go into at this time? Funny enough, like for example, so we've been working on opening a Hong Kong office for the last uh, six or seven months and we just opened it actually yesterday Congrats. and, and uh, it's in the worst time possible in Hong Kong with all the protests. Yeah. Right? So, so I'm like, okay, so that tactical decision doesn't look like it's going to pay off in the short term. Uh, Could you, um, you couldn't plan that. You couldn't plan that, yeah. right? So that's what I'm saying. So what was in your control, you'd, you'd, you'd push as much as you can uh, uh, from that perspective. So, you know, it, that, that's how we approach fear is that what can you control, focus on delivering the best value you can for that and then the rest that happens, it happens, you either are going to get really unlucky or slightly unlucky and you'll still be able to recover from it. Right? And we've had a lot of those. We've had a lot of those uh, uh, big balls thrown at us that, that you have to either dodge or uh, yeah. uh, you catch them and you figure out what you're going to do next. Yeah, that's that's because, you know, like in early days of business, like uh, in the industrial revolution, you know, the companies were there for tens of years, 20, you know, like decades or so. And, and now the things are changing. It's almost you cannot find an advisor to advise you or someone, oh, he's having the same company, let's see what he does or whatever. It's very fine to f- uh, find a, uh, hard to find a, 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 a role model yep. in, in, this, yeah. in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. You are more than 100% correct, right? Yeah, so on you. that one, uh, um, <laughs> I, I, because it was two years ago, uh, I went for a small course at Harvard. So another thing I do a lot from a personal learning point of view, I embed myself in different economies for a couple of weeks at a time, 
to try and understand what's happening there. So you learn the culture, the people, why they are you know, treated as the biggest change makers in the world, etc. And I said, I said, you guys are the case study heaven of the world, right? Of so can you tell me, is there a supply chain organization that's so intricately created with different partnerships and different geographies and whatever that you can give me some sort of case study that I can see what happened, right? And it's difficult to find, right? Because business models are evolving so quickly that you can't find them overall, it's, right? And I think business model innovation is actually more disruptive than actually just creating of new products uh, overall. Um, and, and I think w- w- when you start thinking about that, you ask questions, okay, am I doing something totally wrong because I can't find anybody else in the world that's done this, yes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, and I think that's, again, a big question of self-doubt that comes through. Uh, but then you but keep, it's exciting also. It's exciting. very exciting. Yeah. But then the validation is the customer, right? You're adding value to somebody's life and yeah. that's the validation that you always go with going forward as long as you can continue to win customers, continue to bring customer satisfaction uh, and grow your, grow your uh, footprint because now we're moving to a point that if we want to become truly global and that name only came two years ago to the company um, uh, was that we need to create a version of our expertise that's scalable on a global b- uh, model and that is technology, right? Uh, how do we make every interaction of our customer totally digital? Everything from communication to processing, uh, ship to payments, the whole whole lot, and process, that's what, process, process is, and that's uh, what we're working at the moment. Yeah. That's what we're working. No, uh, I think that uh, we can uh, wrap up this uh, conversation because we had a lot of uh, inspirational talks and and, and uh, sentences and, and topics and paragraphs, whatever. But I really think that uh, what sums it up the best could be the the, the thing that uh, what's the worst that can happen. Yeah, I mean, that's I, you know, what your grandfather said. Is uh, something I mean, that uh, those those are for the small decisions in life, right? If people say, you know, I'm afraid to go and ask this, I said the worst that can happen, they're going to say no. You move on to the yeah. next door, then, right? They won't kill you, but but don't leave that stone unturned with uncertainty yeah. in your mind of what if. Right? Yeah, don't leave the what if. You know? <laughs> it's good that you realize that at a very young age. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the last one is hope is not a strategy. So don't hope for it to happen, right? Hope <laughs> make, is make not a, a strategy. Date, make a date to it. Exactly. And then, uh, and then yeah, you can't hope continue. for it to come to you. Yeah. Hope is not a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, as as your company is run by by, by you and your father. Yeah. Uh, how how do you, uh, how those two world, worlds uh, work together? Yeah. No. This is this I get yeah, asked this question. I get this question, <laughs> question a lot. So I think the. So he, he came from, uh, like I said, the real estate side, where it was very simple. I had yeah. one tenant. Uh, it was over. I got, yeah. met him once a year. Yeah. That was it. When I was starting to suggest, why don't we offer the service space, he said, said to me, he's like, are you going to deal with it? Because I don't want to deal with 100 employees collecting money <laughs> and dealing with the processes from that point because I'm done with that part of yeah. my life. So he was very clear from uh, an early age that uh, he was going to be um, uh, uh, the chairman of the business. The strategic, uh, point. strategic point of view. Yeah. He sits on all of our boards to understand what's going on. He runs the financial strategy of the group. Um, other than that, he, he says, I'm I too old for that. I think people can dream about yes, that, yes. That, that support no, we, in, he, no, in their early stages of startups and, uh, and the things. What, yeah. what I think was, was most valuable at that point was that we both entered the industry with zero knowledge. If it was... A handover, ah, that's yeah. when you see conflicts coming because I know better than you. I've been doing this for 30 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Here, this he, is how it is done. <laughs> no, <laughs> here it was, we don't know anything about this business together, but you have a lot more experience of how to deal with people, how to deal with the outside world, and that's what I'll learn from you on. But the business part, the business model, the customers, what they need, we're learning that together going forward. And that's why it was a true essence of a partnership rather than a, 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 hand, a handing down of things going forward. No, no, I think that... Uh, I was very lucky with that. Very yeah, lucky that, with that. That, that is something that people... Uh, as I said, dream about having Absolutely. support like that. I fully agree. And and uh, I, I, what what I can tell, he uh, taught you and and, and, your, and your grandfather also. You know, like uh, being open to the innovations. And and maybe this is something that uh, we can wrap up this conversation with uh, on future generations. What do you uh, uh, teach your kids today? So so my kids my kids are very young. They're about eighteen months and nine months old. But I have. A very uh, uh, agenda specific five things that I think every person today that's just forming their life needs to sort of um, uh, uh, try and create. So number one is you you have to be very good at um, uh, synthesizing information. Today we live in a world where information is overdosed and, av- yeah. and available for any problem you might have. It's all at your fingertips. So how do you synthesize it together? Second thing in the world today, mental maths is still important. Don't rely on a computer for that one. It helps you in every part of your life. Getting change at a shop to negotiations in the boardroom. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, mental maths really helps. 
Third is uh, being a very good orator and public speaker because no matter what you're doing in life, you're selling some way or the other, right? <laughs> yes. uh, 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 so you got to understand that. Yeah. Second is uh, empathy because of uh, you still will be doing business with humans uh, for for the bigger things overall. Sure. So understand how somebody else can think. And the last one is humility. Understand that you can be grounded overall. And I don't think schools teach that very well. And that's what I hope to be able to pass on to generations below me. Success. That these are five skills yeah. needed to basically be successful. Success is borrowed, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Abhishek, thank you very much for this conversation. Uh, I would really like to chat more in front of the cameras. And and, no, and, and I hope really that we inspire someone. I, even, I hope even, so too. Even, hope even, so too. Even, yes. even, even one person, after seeing this uh, uh, vlog, Uh, uh, went and did only one thing that he or she was afraid of uh, it's enough uh, to know and then passing the knowledge is something that uh, is very uh, uh, gracious and, 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 and really thank you very much for it no, and, uh, it's my pleasure thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed it and next time we see Abhishek here we will uh, add one other zero to the number of employees but <laughs> let's keep it uh, no we're, we're trying to go the other way how can I do 10 times as much and work with the same people right yeah. that's what I want to go to that's what I want to go to <laughs> <laughs> that's a good conclusion to this conversation absolutely thank you very much Ivan, for bye, yeah. bye bye Thank you so much. Really, really nice having you. And and of course, you know what to do. If you like this conversation, subscribe or like uh, uh, this uh, video, and uh, go to our social media channels and uh, tell us what we what you want to hear uh, uh, in this uh, vlog. Uh, and keep in mind that the only constant thing in life is the change.